Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Gilbert's Bar G Ranch sits between the Rocky Mountains and the Sinbad Desert in Castledale, Utah. Since the 70s, Dwayne Gilbert has run a variety of livestock, including cattle and horses. Today, semi-retired, he raises a small herd of Grant Zebra. Horses have been domesticated for thousands of years. Yet despite how similar they appear, zebra have never been tamed. They've had lions chasing them for thousands of years, OK? Anything new, anything happens, they run. That's the only thing they know is to run or bite and kick. So if they're cornered, they're going to bite and kick. I've heard stuff on TV that they've seen instances where a zebra could crush a lion's head. I would believe it. Dwayne has been running zebra for around 20 years and applies the knowledge he's gained from raising horses. We raised horses for a lot of years. We. Uh, we had a, a breeding stallion run 20 head of brood mares. Uh, so I, I understood horses a lot. And a friend of ours in California says, you know, you like horses. You do really well. You got to try zebras. And so we bought a few zebras, and we just really enjoyed them. When we got our first zebras, it was a little bit cold. So I called the zoo and they said, oh, you have to have heated barns and you have to have this and you have to have that. So I did that and the zebras were beating each other up. They didn't like being contained. And so I, when I called my friend, he says, turn them loose. Zebras have to have a place to go. I turned them loose and everything was fine. To an experienced rancher like Dwayne, handling a zebra herd is not unlike raising other, more common livestock. When we load the babies up, when they're ready to wean, we'll go up to our corrals, and I'll feed them up there, and we'll put them in a corral. The next day, I'll feed outside the corral, and I'll just stand at the gate and wait for the ones to come out that I don't want until we have what we want left in there. We go from there into a loading alley and, and right into a horse trailer. It's like working with wild horses or cattle. They're not broke to lead. You're not going to just push them in. If you'll notice, I fed my zebras. I strung the hay out. They're just like other animals. They have a pecking order. 
If you don't string it out, if you've got it all in one container in a feeder, you're gonna have three or four in there and you're gonna have them kicking and biting and they'll still grab the hay, pull it out of the feeder and eat it off the ground. And so I'd rather bring it out here where there's some grass and it's a little bit cleaner and string it out, let the zebras find their pecking order and they have a place to run. They have a place to go more than just 10 feet in case something happens. Dwayne's years owning zebra have made him highly knowledgeable about his striped equine herd. If there's a situation that we have to have a vet here, then we'd, we'd sure call him. I've used a couple of different vets. I know more about them than they do, but they're there with their experience and so that they can help do their end of it. As far as bringing them in, putting them in a chute or something, uh, you know, I'm more familiar with them and they just kind of stand back and then when we get them in there, then they, they're able to do what they can. While many zebra owners raise their unusual pets to be fully domesticated, Dwayne prefers his to remain wild. I leave them wild for a reason. I, I don't halter break, I don't bottle feed my baby zebras. When I want zebras in my herd, I want them so that they're scared of me, okay? I don't want one that's not scared of me to where uh, if, if there's an incident, it's gonna, you know, hurt me. I don't want that. As any other animal, especially equine, you take a stallion, and if they're not scared of you, when they get their hormones, a, a, a horse of any kind, you don't know if they can turn on you or at some time bite you. And zebras are the same. And if they're tame, they're not scared of you. And I can take my stallions and, and uh, th they're just like this. Slow down a little bit, bud. You can feed them, they'll come up to you, be right by you when you wanna feed them. But if you move, they're gone, okay? I like that. Another thing I like about this, this is natural out here. There's cleaner grass, they have an area, they're not in a corral where it's chances of uh, infections or stuff. As a practiced rancher, Dwayne is always alert when working around large animals, especially unpredictable wild animals with a kick that can easily crack a skull. We do have coyotes here. We have mountain lions that will come down occasionally from the mountains. One of the things we have to watch is dogs. A zebra will kill a dog real fast. And yet, if they're in a contained area, the dog will scare them. So that's, again, if they're out here, they're fine. They'll chase a dog down because it's a predator to them and they're gonna defend their babies. If I could probably walk over there, but anybody different, uh, they, it, they're just scared. They're leery of anything new, anything, you know, more than one person out here. Zebras are aggressive animals, and fights between males are common and violent. In May of 2018, a woman in Zimbabwe was attacked by a zebra she had kept as a pet for 10 years. It bit off her thumb and part of one breast. Even as an old hand, highly experienced in handling livestock, Dwayne has been on the receiving end of a zebra's bad mood. There was a time I sold a, a little male zebra and he was, I think, three or four months old. And the guy wanted me to deliver him. So in order to keep it calm, to keep from hurting itself, I rode in a horse trailer with it and I had a halter on it and I would hold it. And he kept trying to bite my leg. Every time, <laughs> every time he, you'd think he was okay, he'd go wham and he'd try to bite my leg and I'd have to hold his head up. You know, another time we weaned a baby uh, that was just a, a week old from its mother. And I usually run them through a, a chute 
that's got rubber belting on it to protect them. And then we just let the mother out and hold the baby. Well, I got in with the baby after the mother got out and she was going over the top trying to bite me. I thought, you know, this is not a good situation. I should have been farther away, but luckily she couldn't reach me. But there again, she was protecting her baby. A strong protective instinct and an equally strong tendency to startle makes for a highly unpredictable animal. So do zebras make good pets? People want some that are bottle fed. When they want a bottle fed one, they take them anywhere from two days old up to 10 days old to 30 days old, and they can still bottle feed them. When they bottle feed them, it just makes them gentler. Uh, petting zoos want a gentle zebra, okay? People that uh, want to put one with a couple of horses and have in their yard, in their pasture, they, they want one that's calmer, so they'll buy one and raise it on a bottle. Other people, I've seen them take them at six months old, 10 months old, uh, a year old, and put a halter on them and still break them to lead. They take a lot of work in order to get them at that point, though. A bottle-fed baby will, will bond with uh, the person that's feeding it. We've seen an instance in uh, California one time we visited some friends and they had a little bottle baby zebra and it was only 30 days old. And they had kind of a party. Well, this zebra would follow its mother around, which is feeding her, you know, on a bottle, follow her around. And if somebody would come up and talk to her, she would get in between the two people. Like, this is my mom, leave her alone. <laughs> Dwayne also breeds and sells his zebras, and his customers have a whole range of different reasons for wanting to own one. You know, I've been raising them over 20 years, and uh, you know, uh, you just, I don't know, it just seems like we have a number of people every year still call and say, you know, I got a zebra from you, I want another one, and of course petting zoos, they've been good clients. There's still so much of the public out there that doesn't know that you can own a zebra. And it seems owning zebras can also bring some completely unexpected surprises and special moments. One time a young girl from Salt Lake called me. She had heard we had zebras and she had just loved them. And I didn't know her. She called and says, if we brought a photographer down, could we get some pictures of me in my wedding dress no. with the zebras? And I says, you can try. But I says, you put a white dress on and step out in front of them zebras, and they're going to leave. And she says, well, I'd really like to try. I just love everything about zebras. Her and her mother showed up, and she got in her wedding gown and had the photographer down here. And we came down here and I put some feed out for the zebras, and they left the feed and walked right up behind that girl in that mm -hmm. white dress like, well, that is something different. You just don't know how they're gonna act. So many times I think they're gonna just run and get away from anything that's new, and yet all of a sudden they'll turn around and, and say, hey, this doesn't scare us. See, we've got one here that says, there is something different over there. <laughs> They may not make good riding or working livestock, and their flighty nature makes them dangerous. But it's clear that the lives of Dwayne and his family are obviously enriched by having their very own zebra herd. We love our zebras. I'll come out here in my truck and watch them and watch them, and, and you'll see the same thing as you'll see zebras in the wild. And to watch them run and play Especially the babies, you know, you'll get four or five babies together and they'll just run around the pasture playing and, and dart in and out of the other mares. And they're an animal. So you just have to watch them and learn, learn about them.
Well, yes, they're cute, all right. Aren't they a little unusual looking? Yes, they're monkeys. Chimpanzees share 98% of our DNA. Their intelligence, playful nature, and their resemblance to human babies once made them popular entertainers and even popular pets. Oh, boy, please stick that in your mouth. Now, boy, you mustn't fight like this. Danny, sit up here in the chair. Out of all kinds of creatures that you could have as pets, chimps are probably the worst pet that you can ask for, for the chimps' benefit. You may get the greatest joy in the world by having a chimp, but what does the chimp get out of it? Martine Collette is the founder of Wildlife Way Station, an exotic animal sanctuary that a colony of 40 chimpanzees now call home. Chimps need chimps. They need to grow up in a colony with young chimps and old chimps and in-between chimps and chimps of personality, cranky chimps and happy chimps and dominant chimps and subordinate chimps and chimps learn by watching. And baby chimps learn everything by watching the adults. And they grow up with chimpanzee skills, which then allows them to take the rightful place in the world of chimpanzees. Having worked closely with chimpanzees for more than 40 years, primatologist Bob Ingersoll agrees. I mean, it's like being a human. You could build me the nicest apartment on the, on the planet. I could live here in this apartment and have a beautiful view like I do, but if I didn't have anyone to talk to or anyone to express my, my humanness to, uh, that would be a pretty harsh existence. Chimps need other chimps, just like humans need other humans. Bob was part of the controversial NIM research project in the 1970s in which researchers explored captive chimpanzees' ability to learn language. Chimps are chimps, uh, bats are bats, and they, and they behave with their genetic predisposition, but on the cellular level, they're very similar to us. So it makes sense to me that those animals are thinking just like us. I actually had two years of experience before I met Nim, and Nim came back to the University of Oklahoma in, in September of 1977. So I knew all of his brothers. I uh, knew several of his other siblings that were twins, several female and male chimps. But I, I took to Nim quickly, and, uh, and I saw Nim as a needy chimp that needed a friend, and I wanted to be his friend. Bob worked very closely with Nim and his siblings, teaching them American Sign Language. He eventually learned that chimpanzees are not as similar to human beings as we'd like to think. First and foremost, chimps need to be with other chimps. Secondarily, they need an area, a, a place where they can be together that's comfortable to them. And in captivity, that's very difficult. I mean, I work with a number of sanctuaries, and, and that's always our problem, that uh, no matter what, you can't give them freedom. We do what I call the illusion of freedom as best we can, but at the end of the day, they're still in captivity. And like I keep saying, captivity is the enemy. In most U.S. states, it is now illegal to own a chimp. And since 2015, when captive chimpanzees were classified as an endangered species, they can no longer be used in invasive testing. A few years ago, the United States, you know, put a moratorium on that and then ended it. And NIH and, and uh, the government agencies that own the chimps that, that were part of all that are now in the process of retiring them. Uh, Chimp Haven has been established, which is the National Chimp Sanctuary in, in uh, Louisiana. There are several hundred chimps there and probably several hundred more that will be going there. So, so chimps in the United States are, are at least the ones that were institutionally held by either the government or, or pharmaceutical manufacturers or drug companies or hospitals. They're now in the process of retiring those animals. The pets, on the other hand, and the entertainment chimps, not quite so lucky. Most of my colony is from biomedical research and I am 
pleased and proud to say chimpanzees are amazing. They are very philosophical. They do learn. They adapt well. And we probably have the biggest uh, group of chimpanzees in the Western United States here. And there are bigger chimp sanctuaries in Florida and in uh, Louisiana. And they have, of course, bigger grounds and big opportunities than we do here. But based on all the knowledge I have had, we've had only one really, really tragic uh, chimp that came to us. He was a self-mutilator and he would bite and rip and destroy anything from the end of his fingers to as far as he could reach with his mouth on both arms and hands and down his legs. And it took us five years before we could stop that type of behavior. But stop we did. Well, actually, he did. We gave the opportunities, we gave different options, and he adjusted and adapted. And towards the latter part of his days, the last few years of his life, he lived in a group of chimpanzees. And I'm thrilled. Many chimps now living in sanctuaries came from private owners who learned that baby chimps may be cute, but adolescent and adult chimps can be deadly. No, I, I wouldn't say that a chimpanzee was necessarily a predator in the sense that a big cat or a lion or, or any of those, you know, or a crocodile or, or barracuda fish or whatever, you know, are predators. But in the wild, chimpanzees cooperatively hunt. They eat monkeys, they, they hunt monkeys, they hunt bush buck, uh, and that's fairly natural. Uh, I, I think that's also, you know, I, I'm interested in chimp cognitive behavior, and, and when, you, when you understand what they do in the hunting situation in the wild, it's fairly complicated. They send out points, they, they, they talk amongst each other, they move the animal to the tree that they're going to you know, do whatever. So the planning and, and the advanced thinking and those sorts of things that you see in that context are, are, are complicated. And they are definitely preying on those monkeys. Those who do choose to take on chimpanzee ownership rarely keep their dangerous pets for more than a few years. Very seldom, very seldom. By the time a chimp is five, six years old, sometimes seven, it's already becoming a chimp. It's assertive and it wants to do this. And unless you understand chimps and you are a good and a kind trainer, you're not gonna be able to teach this chimp what you need him to do because you're not treating him in that manner. This is your, this is your pet, this is your baby, and they can be dangerous. As you've heard about some of the accidents that happen throughout the world, they're pretty brutal. In 2009, Charla Nash was severely mauled by her friend's exotic pet. She lost both her hands, her nose, ears, and her sight. Time for 911, where's your emergency? Oh, this is Sandy from 241 Rock, Rock Pyramid Road. What's Send the problem? The police. Send the police. He's killing my friend. Who's killing your friend? Get my chimpanzee. He, he ripped her apart. Hurry up. Oh, Hurry up, please. There's someone on the way. We're going to police. He shoot him. What is the monkey doing? Tell me what the monkey's doing. Oh, he, he ripped her face off. The easily visible muscles on this chimp with alopecia show just how strong these chimpanzees are. Combine that strength with almost human intelligence, and the chimp can be a formidable threat. Chimps are dangerous because most people do not understand what is a chimpanzee. In a world of chimpanzees, might is right. You know, there is a very definitive hierarchy and so on and so forth. There is order in a chimp colony, 
It may not appear so for somebody standing outside and watching some of the behavior, but there is order. But chimps are dangerous. They are five times as strong as you are. They have an intellect of five, six, and occasionally even a seven-year-old child. That's very bright. They can plan, they can figure, they can create situations where they will pre-plan things. So, and they're also, they can be very volatile. And so somebody does something against them, they're explosive and volatile. And they have teeth this long, and I've got arms, and they can do serious damage to people. Due to recent changes to legislation, sanctuaries are also seeing an increase in surrendered pet chimps. Well, I, I think that uh, those people that own chimps uh, are less out there now. I think that those people uh, should be examining the next step, which would be sanctuary. The pet chimps especially, I think, because I work at the Center for Great Apes, I know what they do and I know it's righteous. I know that they've taken animals in that, that didn't, you know, you wouldn't think would have a chance to be integrated into a group and then become a chimp, but I've seen it happen. And, uh, and I know people that have turned their chimps over to us who we don't, we don't deny them access. They get to come and visit. We don't disallow them from coming to visit their ex-pets. But uh, we have a number of people that, that had chimp pets that, that realized their mistake and have uh, rectified that by turning their chimps over to us. So, uh, I mean, the reality is that uh, this is ending slowly but surely, and it's fewer and fewer chimps are sold in the United States per year. There are probably around 400 chimps that are still kind of up in the air in terms of what's going to happen, where they're going to go. And slowly but surely, we are attempting to move the chimps that aren't in an accredited situation into an accredited situation. Chimpanzees that come to sanctuaries from private ownership situations often have a hard time learning how to be chimps again. The chimps who've never seen grass or trees or sky or birds, I mean, they're startled by it and they're a little leery of it. They can be fearful to step outside, but a chimp's got a great brain and it's curious and it does step out eventually and it, it will sit and it will look and it will figure things out, and it'll watch by example. Most chimpanzees raised in captivity still enjoy and even seek out human contact. We here believe in creating an atmosphere where the chimps are trusting of their keepers and of their supervisors, of their people. So you can bring them along you can make them feel secure. You can give them options of friends. They can choose their friends who they want to hang out with. You give a chimp an opportunity and you help it along in the areas where it has not been comfortable. They settle very nicely. There are a number of chimpanzees that have been in situations that are so egregious that I can tell you about one named Clyde who lived for 35 years in a box in a garage. Uh, that's just wrong. And so when an animal like that comes to the Center for Great Apes, we, we read as best we can the behavior of that animal and we do what's best we think for them. If they solicit our, our attention, we give it to them. If they solicit our grooming, for example, not all of us, but the ones of us that have been clearly trained and checked out so that we don't lose our hands or fingers or whatever, uh, we do that. Uh, what we do more than anything, though, is we try to interject that chimp in with other chimps. We try to introduce them together. And we've been fairly successful at the center. Some captive chimps even prefer being with humans to being with other chimpanzees. There are a couple of cases that, and one in particular, a chimpanzee that I, a beloved chimp to me that passed away a few years ago named Denise. She just didn't get along with chimps. She didn't have that opportunity to be a chimp when she was a 
young, and she didn't like chimps. She grew up in the home. She drank beers and cigarettes, used cigarettes, and when she came to us, it was very tough, and she was a tough lady. She didn't like chimps. She wanted to be with humans, and at the end of Denise's life for the last two years, we did the best we could to make her life as, as fun and as positive. Still being around other chimps, just not in direct contact because it, it didn't work out for her. But for the most part, we tried as best we can to get chimps with other chimps. And it's a beautiful thing when you see a chimp that's never been with a chimp grooming one another, rolling around and being a chimp. And when that happens, we don't interject. We purposefully move away from that. We attempt to let them be chimps. We don't approach them if they approach us and they solicit our, you know, like, hey, Bob, come over here, and, you know, because chimps know how to, you know, get your attention. Like that, for example, or, or you know, <coughs> or whatever, you know, they get your attention, then you know it. And then you, you know, you decide whether or not, you know, that's something that's appropriate or not. The consensus among great ape experts is that chimpanzees need to live like chimpanzees. Martin believes that even captive colonies should be able to live as wild chimps. You know, it's interesting. I believe in the case of chimpanzees, I think every chimp group anywhere in the world should be allowed to reproduce every five, six, seven years. Because a baby in a chimp colony is a glue that keeps them together. It is the joy. They are so alive. They are so interested in the baby. And there are aunts, and there are uncles, and there are kids to play with, and there, everybody loves a baby. And I think the quality of life for chimps is greatly enhanced when every so often there's a baby. So I think, I believe, although we don't do it, but I personally believe we should allow decent sized groups of chimps to have a baby every so many years. Chimpanzee family groups may seem similar to humans, and their babies may seem just as adorable as human babies. But all that we have learned about chimps tells us that, no matter how much they resemble humans, they are simply not meant to live as humans. Well, I am against captivity in the sense that for these animals that shouldn't be captive, but I also understand that they came, they came to be in the situation they are over time and from a time when we don't have the viewpoint we do now. And uh, so some of the chimps are caught up in that. They're, for the most part, they're aging out. I mean, we have a lot of 40, 50 year old chimps that are uh, passing away in sanctuaries. And as they pass away, the numbers dwindle. And ultimately, I think that uh, those situations will end. And there won't be the surplus of animals that we had in the 60s and 70s and 80s when there wasn't a moratorium on breeding and that sort of thing. Find a nice sanctuary and place that animal in a nice sanctuary to allow this animal to have an opportunity to grow up to be a chimpanzee. In the United Kingdom, exotic pet ownership is on the rise. However, not all owners possess the knowledge or experience to provide adequate care for these animals. Ark Wildlife Park is the United Kingdom's first rescue zoo, homing over 180 animals who have been rescued or donated from private pet ownership. Ark Wildlife Park originally started off life as purely a reptile sanctuary. So all the snakes and lizards in here are ex-pets, and then over the years, people started bringing us more and more unusual and weirder animals. This in here is a little grey banded king snake. This little lady in particular is an albino, so she's got some beautiful coloration on her. And you can see why these guys are popular as a pet species. 
these little snakes and lizards can make great pets because if you go away for the weekend, as long as you've made sure there's someone to give them some fresh water, these guys aren't gonna pine for you like a cat or a dog is going to, and they certainly don't need taking out for walks. So in some respects, they can actually be much less lower maintenance than sort of some of our more traditional pet animals like cats and dogs. But whether you actually get that reciprocal love come back to you, not really, I'm afraid. I don't think she'd ever miss me if I wasn't around. Like with any pet, people really need to do their research. And the other thing you have to factor in, a hamster or a, or a gerbil is going to be with you two, three years. This little lady here, she can potentially be with us for about 20 odd years. So reptiles, as a general rule, not all species, but as a general rule, they can have quite long lifespans. Compared to sort of most pet species, no, they thrive in a much smaller environment because that's what they're sort of designed to do. The reason why you go out into the countryside, you very rarely, if ever, you'll see a snake coming across you because they're too busy hiding. That's what snakes do, I think. So they do like to be sort of like a bit more confined than traditional animals. A small crocodilian, the best way to handle them is to grab them firmly right behind the jawline so they can't swing their head back and grab you. Rudolph's reaching the size now where another foot or so I wouldn't be ha happy handling him um, but at this size one man can easily handle one of these crocodilians if you know what you're doing and you've been trained um, again this is where it comes to they don't make good pets make a mistake they can let easily take your finger off just gonna go in behind grab him by the back of the head gently ease him out and then keep your hand locked behind and also support the hind quarters more for his comfort than anything Certainly when he starts getting much bigger than this, we wouldn't be actively handling him. Nowhere near fully grown yet, but uh, he's potentially going to max out about seven or eight foot long. Like most of the animals here on the park, he's one of our rescues, an ex-pet that was being kept illegally. These guys have got one of the strongest bite forces of any animal in the animal kingdom. The crocodilians have got a very powerful bite. Even at this size, this guy could easily remove my fingers, which is why I keep my hands nice and firmly locked behind his jaws, but they're certainly, I couldn't think of a worse animal to have as a pet, really. This guy can potentially live 50 or 60 years. So that's the other thing people have to consider when they get a pet reptile, even the more common pet species like corn snakes and leopard geckos, they're not like a hamster or a gerbil that's going to be with you a couple of years. They've got the potential, a lot of these pet reptiles, 30, 40 years easily. But of course you have to factor in, uh, potentially they are dangerous. No, he's never bitten me, but I don't give him the chance to. Crocodilians, you can't trust them. It's not like a dog or a cat. Even though he's quite relaxed and laid back as far as crocodilians go, I'd never trust him. I don't give him that opportunity. So I'd never let him just sit on my lap loose, as it were. Uh, it only takes one mistake and you're gonna lose a finger. So it's just not worth it. Another animal that shouldn't be confused for a house pet is the lynx. While they may look like a beautiful feline, the lynx is a wild cat and a very skilled predator. This is Echo and she's our beautiful Eurasian lynx. They cover historically Europe and Asia, used to actually be native here to the UK. And all lynx are characterised by those wonderful little tufts on the tip of the ears and the little short bob tail. And they're the characteristics um, of the four lynx species. She's been with us since she was only a little kit. She's not a rescue, she was brought in as an ambassador animal. We want to start helpfully raising funds for the Iberian lynx breeding project, her close cousin, which is also unfortunately the most endangered wild cat species in the world. I certainly couldn't recommend any wild cat species as being kept as a pet. She certainly has a loyalty to me because she's known me since she was a kit and I can safely come in here with her, but I'm the only one that comes in with her just to be on the safe side. At the end of the day, she's a wild animal and you've got to treat them like that. She's not a domestic cat. Despite the purring and the rolling on her back for belly rubs, it can be very easy to forget that these guys are a wild animal. And uh, she's certainly got the, the strength, the ability and the armoury. These guys have got big, long, old claws and teeth on them to do some nasty damage to me. I certainly, if she was a tiger or a lion, I certainly wouldn't be in here with her, no matter what the bond we have. If you were to have a, a bad day, I'd walk away from the situation, whereas if you're saying like a tiger, I wouldn't. But either way, you've got to remember, these are wild animals, so you've got to treat them with that sort of level of respect. They are a predator, basically purely meat eaters, even things like wolves and wild canines. They will actually take uh, vegetable matter into their diet, but cats are strictly, as a general rule, they're, they're meat eaters. But they're one of the most efficient predators on the planet. Cats are fantastically designed to do what they do. Lynx are what you'd call one of the larger members of the small wildcat species, so that excludes things like leopards, cheetahs, tigers and lions. 
they're nowhere near the size of the of the big guys as it were but as far as more the sort of a wild species of small cat like servals ocelots margays they're certainly one of the larger species if people really want to look after an animal like this and they're willing to give it a lovely big enclosure and give it the respect and the time it deserves, then by all means do so, but never be fooled into thinking that this is a suitable pet species um, for sort of 99.5% of people that consider maybe keeping a, a wild cat as a pet, they're really not suitable. Foxes. They're a controversial animal that divide the public's opinion. Some see them as pests and tricksters, while others think they're adorable. Keeping a fox in Britain is legal, however, not without its challenges. They are cheeky, as our crew found out when this guy decided to investigate the camera bag. <laughs> That's what you'd call your traditional UK fox. These grey girls, they are actually exactly the same species. They're just a colour variation that you might be more familiar with in North America. We do rarely get this sort of melanistic dark black grey version in the wild. All three of these guys were born and bred for the UK pet industry. They're incredibly intelligent animals. As you can see, he's having, enjoying an ear scrunch, much like a dog would. Uh, but this, again, is where people sometimes think that maybe they're a good alternative to a, a dog, and they really aren't. They haven't had those thousands of years of domestication. They're really not designed to live indoors. We've heard some reports of foxes being kept in people's flats, and again, they really need to be kept outside if you're going to keep a fox in a nice, big, large outdoor enclosure. They could certainly give you a painful nip, they're not going to remove a finger, they're not going to do anything that's going to cause you any permanent damage, but they could certainly give you a nasty nip if you weren't expecting it. Being a zookeeper, this part of the uh, risk, so we do occasionally when we have to handle these animals, give them vaccinations, they will give you a nip. It's not a pleasant experience, but I wouldn't class them as a dangerous animal in the same respect as maybe the caiman or the lynx. Not having had that domestication, there's far more chance of getting a nip off a pet fox than there would be a dog. Ark Wildlife Park is the home to many different types of animals. Some familiar, like these rabbits, goats and pigs, and others a little more unusual. But they all have something in common. They were once pets in a private ownership. Ark Wildlife Park is the place that animals end up when private pet owners don't or can't care for them. It's important to remember that exotics are not for everyone. These animals will live out their lives in captivity, but play a role in educating the public on the reality of keeping exotic pets. <laughs> 